Hello everyone, Thersites the Historian here, and today we have a special edition of my series on why Bush 43 still sucks. And that edition involves the very video which inspired me to make that series in the first place. When I saw this, that's what spurred me to then look into the Bush Legacy Project and see that George W. Bush was trying to capitalize on the unpopularity of Donald Trump in order to rehabilitate himself. So I've looked more into this channel, it's called Top Tens Net, and this host, Simon Whistler, and maybe some of his writers seem to be full-blown neoconservatives. Um, they cite John Keegan when they talk about war a lot. John Keegan, of course, was one of the major neocon uh, scholars or writers, along with Victor Davis Hanson. And uh, in this video, you'll see that he actually thinks the 10 achievements that he lists balance out all of the really fucked up things that George W. Bush did, and that he's actually an all right to good president. So let's take a look at this video, and I will explain why very few of the things that he says really mattered that much, and also why none of these things come anywhere close to balancing out all of the terrible things that George W. Bush did. So let's get started, and we'll play through this entire video, so that way you can get the full context and share every little inkling of the suffering that I went through watching this piece of fucking shit video. Yeah, um, the whole thing is the conceit of this channel is that they always have to come up with a list of 10 and you'll see very quickly that the need to get to 10 forces them to really subdivide single things. Um, there are three mentions of one thing that you'll see soon, and then two mentions of another, um, just from different perspectives. So basically, they actually only came up with, what is it, like six discrete things. Uh, so just say top six reasons, or just call yourself top list net. Um, but if you're really going to stretch it out to 10 and you are looking at a president who served eight years and your argument is that this person was actually underrated, then you might want to rethink your argument because clearly the argument is wrong. If it took eight years for someone to achieve 10 things that weren't terrible, then that president sucked. That's not very arguable, really. I mean, granted, so far Trump has been more unpopular, but he hasn't sunk to the extreme levels of unpopularity that Bush held at the end of his presidency. So if Trump never rises above 45%, which he hasn't so far, and then he loses office at the end of this first term, then maybe we can then say, yes, Trump was the most unpopular president that we have polled. But, uh, look, so far, Bush holds the crown, and it's not arguably, it's definitely. I mean, popular uh, approval ratings are an objective number, assuming that the numbers are accurate. But usually, if you aggregate all the numbers, you get a pretty good impression of how people feel about him. So, until and unless Trump uh, loses re-election in 2020 and never rises above the 40 to 45 percent mark, then at that point, it would be safe to say Trump is the most unpopular but we're not there yet. And that alone is enough to make him a shitty president, but continue. Yeah, like um, making no bid contracts for military contractors, which has massively driven up the cost of military operations, while also decreasing combat effectiveness and efficiency. Yeah, he's done a lot of things that don't get reported on. He's put, uh, yeah, anyway, I mean, I'll go into all that in my regular series, but you get the point. He also didn't really go after the Enron guys as hard as he could have. Did a lot of shit, and most of it was pretty damn bad. But let's look at the good things Bush did. No. I mean, look, some of the things that they'll list here aren't terrible, and they're actually good, but none of them qualify as awesome. Okay, I mean, awesome should be reserved for something that matters. For instance, George Bush's father passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, the biggest and most important piece of civil rights legislation since the 60s. 
Um, that's pretty awesome. Uh, unfortunately, Shrub has done nothing of the kind. How can you be a secretly kick-ass president? The thing about kicking ass is that you don't need an interpreter to understand when ass was kicked. That's... Have you ever watched the fucking action movie, Simon? He was probably just genuinely shocked that Africa included more than one country. Okay, the thing is, you might be thinking, wow, that's a really strong start. At helping Africa deal with the AIDS crisis, that is a major achievement, and the numbers there speak for themselves. However, this is a rhetorical technique that Simon is employing to make it seem like the things that come later will be even more impressive, when in fact they aren't. And the other thing you'll see is that the next item is basically just another part of this one, Except it's actually less impressive, because it is a disease that's much easier to deal with. So, I'll give Bush credit for what he did in Africa. The thing is, though, that you really need to keep in mind. Bush was the first president who enjoyed a mostly politically stable Africa where America could actually go in and do things. West Africa especially didn't settle down politically until 2000. So no president prior to Bush really had a great opportunity to do much. Now granted, if Eisenhower had been interested, he could have done things. Kennedy started to do things in Africa, but after uh, his assassination, Africa fell into a long series of civil wars um, because African democracies really struggled in most of the latter half of the 20th century. And then it was only around 2000, right when Bush comes into office, that you can actually go to Africa and do things. And to his credit, he did things, however, there's a context here, and that context is that most presidents in the modern era, if given the choice, would have done similar things in Africa. The thing about malaria is that the main way to treat it is to put up mosquito nets and do things like that. It is not nearly as difficult to combat as AIDS. So I don't know why this is higher on the list than the combating AIDS part. And also, this is clearly a related program. It's part of the same initiative. Why are these two separate things? Why not make it, say, a more concise top five list and then say combating disease in Africa and then say he fought malaria, AIDS, etc.? Why divide it up like this? You're clearly padding stats. That's because it was politically unstable, as I just mentioned. Um, you don't normally send American presidents into active war zones. But not only that, but yeah, like I'm saying, most presidents, with the exception of Eisenhower, um, would have done something if the situation permitted. 
Certainly someone like Jimmy Carter would have jumped on the opportunity. Bill Clinton would have done it. Uh, Bush Sr. probably. Reagan, probably. I mean, I don't know for sure, but probably. Uh, Ford, Nixon, almost certainly. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's a ridiculous argument to say that you know Bush was the first person to care about Africa. He was just the first person who both cared and actually had an opportunity to do something. All right, so we just went from two achievements, which if they were made into one, would be a very solid achievement. And now we're about to go into something that is remarkably minor and should not have made a top anything list. And you're about to then contradict it. Yeah, so the decision was made under Clinton. Clinton was president during all of 1999 and 2000. And Kosovo clearly had formed a provisional government and made all the steps necessary to proceed towards statehood. And then it was just a matter of negotiating with Serbia and other powers in the region to make all that happen. So basically, all of the hard work, all of the initial decisions were actually done under Clinton. And then it was up to Bush to appoint some people to go deal with the situation and then let him take credit for it later. This is not a major achievement. Now, it's a big deal for people living in Kosovo, obviously. I don't want to um, you know, undermine that in any way. But to say that, that George W. Bush deserves a great deal of credit for doing something after the decision to do it had already been made before he came into office, it's a little bit of a stretch. It's not a very strong achievement. Now, sure, it would have been messed up had he just said, fuck Kosovo. But realistically, how many people would do that? I mean, and the other thing about American foreign policy that often gets ignored is that there aren't very many meaningful differences between Democrats and Republicans on foreign policy. We don't, we don't shift our alliances when a new party takes power. Um, the relationships between America and other countries hardly change at all, depending on who's in office. So uh, it's not as if it took a great deal of political courage for Bush to eschew the advice of all the Republicans and you know go against the grain and do this. This is something that no one opposed. It didn't take any political courage. Okay, another thing about that is that they said, well, Russia didn't want to recognize Kosovo. Russia is the traditional champion of uh, Slavic Christians in the Balkans. And that would have been something that actually mattered in this context if Kosovo shared a border with Russia and thereby would have been um, open to Russian military intervention. But as you saw on the map earlier, Kosovo clearly does not border Russia. So... It's kind of irrelevant that the government of Vladimir Putin was not a big fan of letting Kosovo become independent. Because using a word is an achievement. Calling something a genocide is a bigger achievement than fighting AIDS in Africa, according to this list. How, how, how is it? How can any rational human being... And I see this happen on the left as well. Um, how can, but how can any rational human being value 
saying something over doing something. It doesn't make sense, especially for a president. Because remember, if you're a president, you're there to do things. You run the executive branch, not the oratorical branch or the symbolic victories branch of the government, right? Okay. Anyway, let's listen on. And also remember that um, the Darfur debate was heavily shaped by Christians in the U.S. claiming that it was a Muslim genocide against Christians. And this is also at a time when the war on terror was going on and hysteria about Islamic um, advancement was all over the damn place. So this is another move that required very little political courage for someone who was trying to keep his evangelical base happy. Yeah, um, so the thing is, let's say that you accept the premise that Darfur was a genocide and that the U.S. needed to intervene. I accept premise one, but not premise two. It's not our affair. We shouldn't have sent troops in the first place, but here Simon Whistler, neoconservative hack idiot, is suggesting that the only thing Bush did wrong was not having enough troops to send into Darfur. Again, we don't need to be doing that. All we'll do is antagonize the locals and make it look like the U.S. is anti-Muslim. Um, you know, there's a reason we didn't send troops in aside from overextension, which is another concept that Simon Whistler does not understand on any level. I watched a video of his where he talks about countries that Hitler didn't invade, and he looked at some of them as missed opportunities. And I don't think he understands the finitude of military resources. I don't think that's something that clicks in his little brain. So he was less than shitty in one country's eyes. Let that sink in. In Sudan, George W. Bush is viewed positively. Name another country where that's true. You can't, because it doesn't exist. Okay, a couple things need to be said. Obama also couldn't have kept us in Iraq and Afghanistan if Bush hadn't put us there. But not only that, the thing about Bush's environmental record is that, once again, Whistler whistles past the graveyard. Under Clinton, who mostly sucked on every issue, he did do a couple of minor things to improve the environment. One was requiring that a lot of power plants have scrubbers on them so that some of the toxic chemicals that they put out in the air would be held by a filter. Now, this would require some maintenance, but these things had already been installed, so most of the expense of doing this regulation was already covered. And then Bush came in and said, we don't need that anymore. You can throw away your scrubbers. Pollute as you will. Um, that was just one example of Bush. Uh, he lessened standards across the board when it came to environmental protection. So, 
again, uh, the fact that he did one thing that didn't affect his corporate donors or his oil company buddies is not that impressive. Let's look at this one. If you start to think that, you really need to look at the Iraq War once again. Um, about a million Iraqis were killed or displaced in some way by the Iraq War. And I might be massively understating that number. Maybe it's a million killed and then it doesn't even touch the people who were displaced. Actually, I think that's what it was. I don't remember the number right offhand. But the fact is, humanitarians don't fight wars of choice. They don't do regime change in a country that had nothing to do with an attack on the United States and then go on to massively use uh, that country as a big experiment in privatization. Look up what F. Paul Bremer did. They literally disbanded all of the public sector in Iraq because they were extreme free market ideologues. And that is why the insurgency got so bad because guess what? If you have a bunch of young men with no ability to provide for themselves or their families, um, they're going to get pissed off. And then if all the jobs that are there go to foreign contractors, they're going to think to themselves, hey, maybe those Islamic crazy people running around talking about Western imperialism are right. Because I can look around me and see a bunch of dudes from another country taking jobs that I used to work. I can see a bunch of foreign troops occupying my territory. Humanitarians don't cause large-scale wars and then turn those wars into insurgencies. I mean, granted, maybe it was just sheer idiocy on the part of Bush and his cronies, but there was also a high degree of evil involved in this. Let's continue and talk about the humanitarian hero, George W. Bush. And the alternative was what? Everybody expects the American president to lead the way when there's a natural disaster, either here or one abroad that is of a catastrophic scale. Any American president, including even Donald Trump, would do that. This is not something that is extraordinary or that required George W. Bush to be in office. If Al Gore or John Kerry had been in office, they would have done this too. Um, if Dennis Kucinich or... Uh, anyone, name anyone. If anyone was in office at this time, they would have done this. If John McCain hadn't gotten screwed in 2000 and he had been elected president, he would have done this. Um, I don't, how do you give someone credit for doing one of the basic functions of his job? It's like giving him credit for cutting ribbons at the mall. This is something that goes along with the territory of being the ceremonial head of state and being looked upon as a representative of a country which claims to be a leader in the world and often gives out humanitarian aid in times of need. What's the achievement here? This should not be on this list. Yeah, the thing is, uh, it was an international effort, and it's one example of Bush actually using military power in a competent and responsible manner. And that doesn't really offset all of the other times he used military power for other purposes, or how badly he bungled Hurricane Katrina. During Katrina, there was actually talk of turning it into a free market zone, where the federal government would provide no aid for reconstruction, and companies would just be allowed to run amok and do what they needed to to get the place back on its feet, regardless of the social and economic consequences. Um, you can't just say that him acting in one crisis negates him acting poorly in another. And again, what was the alternative here? 
what would another rational human being in a position of power at this time do? There was no other course of action. This does not make him great to do something that he was required to do by virtue of his job. It's like if someone is responsible for making coffee at the office and then they bring you a cup of coffee at 8.30 as they do every day and you need that cup of coffee to keep going. That doesn't make that person a hero. It means that they're just doing their job. Or if uh, someone's responsibility is to clean up and someone else makes a mess and you bring out paper towels. Again, not a hero, just doing your job. This is the equivalent of that. Yeah, we figured out who the list was about. Wow, and why Bush's name is in the title. Yeah, so anyway, there's another motive at play here, and it doesn't undermine the fact that this was an important thing that he did, and this is one of the few legitimately good things that he did. Okay, the thing about the African debt relief is that the U.S. is competing with China for influence in Africa. And a lot of the dictators in Africa, as in Latin America and elsewhere, owe their position of authority to U.S. intervention. So this is just a way to back down from a policy which clearly failed and to put himself more in line with this whole idea of spreading democracy. So it was somewhat self-serving, but at the same time it did legitimately help people. So you know what? Yeah, put that on the list. I'm fine with that. Um, I just wish that he would extend this idea of debt relief to say, American students who are massively in debt, or people who went into massive debt because of healthcare costs. But he doesn't give a fuck about that. Um, he actually one time told a lady who was up their eyeballs in debt that he was really proud of her for being a single mom who works three jobs and that she should be an example to us all. Um, or he came up with the brilliant idea of starting a healthcare savings account. You know, because that won't be exhausted immediately if you have an illness. Oh, God, kill me. You didn't just call Bush a regular hero. Uh, like, how, how can you admire George W. Bush? Like, what is wrong with you? I mean, God damn it. That's disgusting on so many levels. Uh, it's profoundly idiotic to look at George W. Bush as being a humanitarian hero. Also, the sum of $34 billion dollars in U.S. terms, if we look at the kind of money the U.S. spends on things like the military, doesn't amount to shit. Okay, look at it this way. The military, on, and during Trump's first year, last year, had an $80 billion supplement to their budget added on without debate. There was no debate on that. They just said, all right, cool, $80 billion, here you go. And that was on top of the money they'd already received. $34 billion dollars not all that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. Plus, I'd be willing to bet that American banks and the American government were not really taking that big of a hit on this $34 billion. I'm just a wild guess that it was someone else's money that had been lended. Or that if even if it was American money, that whatever private interests were involved were then compensated more than fairly by the Bush administration, which, if nothing else, was very, very fair to corporations, and to the point of, you know, letting them not pay taxes like General Electric.
well, we're about to get to the one domestic policy achievement. This is the only thing that he did here in the United States which had a positive impact, at least so far as I can remember off the top of my head. And even then, we're going to talk about how this wasn't a 100% clear and good victory for old people who need health care. All right, major objection to what he said here. He said the taxpayers aren't forced to bear the burden of Medicare Part D, basically. That's not true. What happens is the federal government subsidizes the cost of drugs, but they do no cost control. So just like with Medicare and Medicaid, which are not allowed to negotiate drug prices, largely due to people like George W. Bush, the cost is whatever pharmaceutical companies want it to be. So that is why our healthcare spending is so out of control. Now granted, seniors needed relief and they needed it badly. And I'm not really even opposed to Medicare Part D, but I am opposed to the way that it was implemented. It was also a corporate giveaway. Not only did it make getting old in America less expensive, but it made being a pharmaceutical company more profitable because, hey, you don't have to worry about the federal government, uh, you know, taking a single cent from you. In fact, you're going to make more money now um, because they will pay whatever cost you demand. And another thing about Medicare Part D and all other half-assed stopgap measures is that it ignores something very critical that most people now realize. The only civilized and rational way to run a healthcare system in the 21st century is through a single-payer system. Everything else is inefficient, unfair, and really just runs up the cost for no reason without providing benefits or results. If you go into debt for health care and you also aren't guaranteed the best care available, then you are getting fucked. We have seen that single-payer systems actually do save money. Even a libertarian study recently showed that Bernie's Medicare for All plan would save at least $2 trillion. Some people think it would save up to like $13 trillion over a 10-year period. So the point is that while Medicare Part D is a reasonable achievement for a Republican president, it still isn't that impressive in the grand scheme of things simply because it puts off the inevitable and also ignores the fundamental problem while still being a corporate blowjob. So, you know, let's not get too excited. I would put this on his top five list for sure. But that's mainly because he sucked and he had very few real achievements. Now, let's look at another time where he basically did something that had a little bit more to do with saying than doing. Hold on, hold on. Let's rewind just a bit. Because it sounds like he said something pretty fucked. Okay. So he just said 1983 South Sudan collapsed into a civil war. And Bush apparently was the first person to do something about this. And... So give him some credit there, but also make sure to point it out a little more because that would be the important thing. The thing is, though, that's also a major reproach against his predecessors, Reagan, Bush Sr., Clinton, because they all had plenty of opportunities to say or do something about the situation, and they clearly didn't. 
So um, the thing is, a lot of people seem to ignore it because they like whatever party they belong to. We really have not had a decent president in my lifetime. I was born in 86 when Reagan was in office. In my entire lifetime, we have not had a good president. Obama was mediocre. Um, maybe even H.W. was mediocre just because of the ADA, if nothing else. But the rest, Reagan, Clinton, Bush Jr., and Trump have been absolute shit. Uh, anyway... Uh, he's about, he just said these same jerk Muslims from the north were committing genocide, and then he's about to say that the Christians and animists in the south are totally uh, innocent. What he largely ignores, though, is that most of the people who were victims of the genocide in Sudan were other Muslims. Kind of an important detail. So, let's continue. The South was not entirely Christian or animist. That's not entirely accurate. And of the two communities, it's my understanding that the animists suffered way more than the Christians did. If you look at Islamic doctrine, Christians and Jews are people of the book and they are accorded some protections, whereas Islam has a doctrine where you put to the sword people who are not of the book, unless they are willing to convert to Islam. So it kind of would make sense that Animist would be the bigger target, and it looks like they were by all uh, indications. He wasn't an absolute genius at all, ever, on anything. False. You should never use the words genius and George W. Bush in the same sentence. Unless you're trying to run an SNL skit or something like that. That's just, that's an affront to the English language. Um, Webster is rolling over in his grave right now because you just raped the English language in the worst possible way. So if he was so good at dealing with the Sudan, my question to you is simple. Why did he not apply those skills to any other situation that he dealt with? The reason is simple. As I mentioned earlier, the Christian community in the United States was outraged by Darfur because they were under the impression that the majority of the victims were Christian. Actually, the majority were Muslim. But because it was portrayed this way in the U.S., that is what roused public support. So this is the one time that Bush was actually pushed to do something positive, and he did. And it's because he needed those evangelical votes to win re-election in 2004. That's also why he hammered the gays that year as well. It's not because he actually cares about that kind of shit. It's that he needed evangelicals to turn out and vote for him about abortion, the gays, and protecting Christians abroad. That's what it was. That was his only real motive, if we're being completely and totally honest. George W. Bush didn't really care about the Sudan. And I really doubt he genuinely cared about Africa that much either, in general. Okay, so Dick Whistler here 
want you to believe that the collapse of the Sudanese peace agreement was due entirely to Obama being stupid, disinterested, and heartless, whereas George W. Bush was this highly informed, sympathetic, empathetic, you know, just expert on this topic who was passionate and devoted. The thing is, if he were truly that dedicated to this cause, he probably could have gotten Obama's ear and said, hey, I know we have our disagreements, but there is one thing I want you to promise me, and it's something that is very important and that you can share in the credit for because it matters that much to me, and that is this deal with the Sudan. If you have any questions about that, you know my phone number, give me a call. The, the thing is, Bush's post-presidency has been mostly him drawing pictures of himself and writing books to burnish his own reputation and that of his father. That's it. He has just been in hiding until recently, and then he comes up to talk about civility and say that Trump makes him look good because Trump is uncivil. But again, like, look, uh, this also, another major problem with this, and it's not surprising coming from a neocon idiot who clearly knows nothing about foreign policy, diplomacy, or how other cultures work, he never considered the basic possibility that a civil war which broke out in 1983 raged for 20 plus years until a ceasefire had deeper causes and that it took a little more than a US president saying hey I care about this can you stop killing each other to stop and that those causes were not necessarily resolved by a ceasefire and that when you have a ceasefire it can often then break back out into war but of course Simon Whistler doesn't understand that because he willfully does not understand anything if not understanding it makes Bush look better and also like how many British neocons are there? Like, you know, why does he get a channel? Why does this idiot have, I don't know how many subscribers, this video has over 170,000 views. And then most of the comments are just fucking morons saying, wow, I didn't know these great things about Bush. He must be a really good guy. And uh, I really, you know, regret not knowing that back in the day. So, uh, again, I mentioned we had two repeats of one thing that was two things about the Sudan which could have easily been rolled up in the one so him calling Darfur a genocide and then brokering a peace deal obviously is part of the same thing and him fighting diseases in Africa numbers 10 9 and 8 also are the same thing and this time he's going to step out of bounds though Simon Whistler will talk about things Bush has done post president and he will take what amounts to like one visit and make it out as if this has really been what Bush has been up to as uh, an ex-president. Which is completely misleading and shows that Whistler is either extremely dishonest or extremely uninformed or my guess is some combination of the two. So let's see what he has to say. Yeah, all those awesome things, uh, not to mention destabilizing all Islamic countries in general by fighting an elective war of aggression in Iraq and inspiring an insurgency which attracted all kinds of militants from both Africa and the Middle East to come into Iraq to fight U.S. soldiers. You know, that obviously had a great impact for Africa, I'm sure. Uh, anyway, continue. Then how the fuck is it his number one achievement? Also, this is something he's done post-president. We're talking about why he was an underrated president. And not to mention that there's really no evidence provided that he's been spending a significant amount of time on this. This could just be something he attached his name to and then went for like two days to do a photo op. Which is my personal suspicion. Because 
George W. Bush really doesn't care about anything except his reputation at this point. That is the only thing that he has tried to do as a post-president. He has written books about his decisions that he made that were controversial. He's tried to make his dad out to be a better president than he was. He's tried to create a presidential library, which is basically a propaganda center. Um, he has his friends Karl Rove and Dick Cheney out there defending torture. It, and he also has made it out like he was a really um, responsible, dedicated president, unlike Trump. Uh, even though the parallels between Trump and Bush are actually far stronger than the differences. Alright, let's let him finish this little talk about cancer in Africa. Their thing about fighting cancer in Africa, or disease, is that you have to understand that some of the causes of things like disease are environmental factors. You might want to protect the environment. And your risk factors are elevated if you have to deal with poverty. So if you have a poor diet or some other risk factors that go along with that. And Bush has no interest in dealing with structural issues like poverty or the environment. No, ish, no interest at all. So he's not really serious about fighting cancer or any other disease because you can't really fight those things in isolation, at least not if you plan on succeeding. Let's keep going. That's an unbelievable claim. Nothing that you listed comes anywhere close combined. If you combine all of the good things that he did on this list, they still don't even come close to canceling out one of the bad things you listed. The Iraq war. We were lied into a war. Um, the media was complicit in this, but this war was built on a lie. And then we intervened and we got stuck in a quagmire. About a million Iraqis died and probably three to five thousand-ish Americans. I don't remember the exact number, but anyway, a lot. Not to mention all of the veterans who came home crippled or with PTSD. Um, the refugees who came out of there with nowhere to go. Um, so that by itself is a greater evil than all of the goods he did put together. How, how can you not see that? It's obvious. I went to a Donald subreddit recently. And I was surprised that people who voted for Trump, by and large, seem to understand why Bush sucked. They seem to get it. On that one issue, at least. And then we have this fucking idiot with a YouTube channel and a British accent who thinks that doing the normal things a president does, like offering aid to a region which is clearly deprived when that opportunity emerges, or... Um, approving the independence of a country which has already fought and won their independence, that these things somehow cancel out all the really fucked up things that he did voluntarily. We can also talk about what about all the things that Bush missed out on? What about all of the opportunities he had to do positive things that he didn't take? He actually inherited a budget surplus, the first one that had existed maybe ever, at least maybe in, ever in the modern era. And he just wasted it all giving a fucking tax break to the rich. That money could have been used for all kinds of things. Infrastructure repairs, uh, building a green power grid, creating cheaper college, uh, moving us toward a universal healthcare system. Uh, I don't know. You name it. Like, it could have been used for all kinds of things. Or just paying down the debt at the bare minimum. And he didn't do any of that shit. So... You, you can't make an argument that Bush was a good president. It doesn't exist. It is impossible for any intelligent, intellectually honest human being to make an argument that George W. Bush was anything less than a piece of fucking shit as president. Anyway, that's all I've got to say about Bush. He can go fuck himself. Um, he is the, as I said before, the second worst president in American history other than Buchanan, who let the Civil War break out. And maybe you could even add Pierce in there, too. Maybe Bush is actually the third worst president. Yeah, maybe this video has moved me to, move, to uh, promote Bush from second to third worst. Yeah. Okay, anyway, I'm done. And uh, 
wow, this was longer than I thought it would. I spent 50 minutes talking about a 12 minute video because Simon Whistler is such a dishonest sack of shit. Anyway, uh, I will see you around. There's Scythes the Historian out. Hopefully I will have my Michael the Third video up relatively soon. Of course, I'm talking about the Byzantine Emperor, Michael the Third, And like George W. Bush, and that's why I brought him up, they were both alcoholics. <laughs>